You know, there's something powerful that happens when we just sing without instruments or anything. Pastor Rick, just stay here for a second. I want, I want us, I just think the Lord wants to hear our, our voice today. And I just want you to sing it out right now. I've decided to follow Jesus. Just lead us, Pastor Rick, just with our voices. No, no keys or anything. Got to get the right key. I have decided Lift your voice to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I want you to do it one more time. But listen, I don't want you to hold back anything. Don't worry about the person on your left or your right. I want us to lift our voice as loud as you can. Sing. Don't worry about what anyone around you thinks. Come on, sing it one more time from the top of our voice, the top of our hearts. Let's just sing it to the Lord right now. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Come on, give God praise today. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated. Thank you, Lord. I sat in a room of 70 people last Sunday morning, and that's about how loud it was. Man, they sang with such passion in Tanzania, East Africa. They sang with such vibrancy, and I just, I felt like the, the, the level of their singing was their dependency on God. They had nothing else. They just had him. They just had Jesus. And they weren't gonna they weren't gonna let anything else go. They were just gonna give it everything they had. Amen. Something so cleansing to our hearts when we can just cry out to him. Wherever you are right now, just when you know that you're not further than a heart's cry to Jesus, that he's here, he's near, he's ready. My heart's so full today, and I just asked the Lord to give a word uh, to us in season. And uh, we're in a series called The Fight. I thank God for this series. I thank God for his word. I thank God for our pastors and our leaders. Uh, Pastor Bobby did a tremendous job last week. Thank you, Pastor Bobby, for bringing a great word to us. And the week before, Maria, our director of missions and outreach, come on, what an amazing testimony and word in season. And uh, my wife and I, for the last 10 days, were in East Africa, in a country of Tanzania, Never been there before, but God filled my heart uh, with the experiences. And people have asked me, how, how was it? I said, it was overwhelming. It was like nothing I've ever experienced before. And I've been to different parts of the world. I've been to Africa. Uh, this is my fourth time in Africa in different countries. Nothing like what I experienced over the last 10 days. I hope to give you a small taste of it today. But the, the word that I asked the Holy Spirit to just speak to my heart, and I, and I feel it comes to us today, and I just want to challenge you with this. And it's the big idea of today's message. It comes just from 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. I'm just going to read one verse of scripture, and then we're going to get into the gospel of Mark and help us to understand what it means to fight to follow Jesus. This is the prophet Elijah speaking to a group of people who in their, with their mouths have professed that they followed God, but their actions and their lives were lining up differently. They were torn. And so Elijah begins to speak to the people, and he's standing, and the prophets of Baal are there, and there's this giant showdown on Mount Carmel, and, and as he's there, he speaks to the people, and the word the prophet says to them then is the same word the Spirit of the Lord says to us today. He says, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, then follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. But the people said nothing. What do you say today? Here's what God says. Here's what the Spirit of the Lord speaks to us from his word. He says, if God is Lord, then follow him. If anything else is that important in your life, if you're serving something else, then follow that. But don't stand on the fence any longer. Here's what the big idea today is. You can't win the fight on the fence. 
You can't win the good fight, the fight that you've been called to. You can't win it sitting on a fence. You can't waver between two opinions any longer. If God is God, then follow him. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then follow him. Fight to follow Jesus. Do whatever you can to follow him. And, I, and I, I know the part of the reason why God brought me all the way around the world to prepare me for a message like today is because all I witnessed for 10 days was a group of people in two different parts of Tanzania that every single day they have to fight to follow Jesus. Every single day it's a fight just to put one step in front of the other and keeping their eyes fixed on him. Man, persecution, Christianity in the parts of the world that I was able to experience, it's under incredible persecution. I was able to sit, stand among two completely unreached people groups. We went in and out of villages, and you had to wonder each time we came to a group of people, do they even know who Jesus is? Man, could you go anywhere today in our nation and say, you know who Jesus is? Well, yeah, I kind of know about him, the cross, the church. Like, the, you, there are places in this world, thousands of places and people group. You go and say, who is Jesus? They look at you like, we don't know who Jesus is. Do you know that? There are people in this world never even heard the name of Jesus. Whenever we come to the, the gospel of Mark right now, Jesus is during his ministry walking with his disciples and he's going into the northernmost parts of Israel and people have already heard about him. I mean, this is just within a few years. His ministry is just beginning, and they've already heard about him. And there's all kinds of different things being said about him. So Jesus, in verse 27, begins to ask his disciples around Caesarea Philippi. He says, who do people say that I am? In verse 28, they replied, and they said, some say you're John the Baptist. Others, they say you're Elijah, who we just talked about a few minutes ago. Others say one of the prophets and Jesus then said, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. This is a loaded phrase. It means you're the one God promised to come and save us. So I ask you this question today. Who is Jesus to you? Is he just a figure of a story? Is he a fictional character? Is he just a good person, a good man? Is he a healer? Or is he God? If he's God, if he's Lord, then follow him. Jesus says, who do you say I am? It doesn't matter what everyone else says about Jesus. It matters at the end of your life what you believe about him, how you've responded to what you believe about him. And so he asked this question. I'm still amazed that we can go in and out of villages in this world today and we can ask that question, who is Jesus? And they don't even know. There's a group of people in East Africa that are called the Datog people, 300,000 people, and until just a few years ago, none of them had ever heard the name of Jesus before. They live in the remotest villages in the remotest parts of Africa. And they're there and they worship uh, spirits and other kinds of things. They practice witchcraft and they have witch doctors. And they've never heard about the name of Jesus. In fact, some missionaries went through there. And they went to go see if they'd ever heard. And they have to drive four hours just to get to one of the villages it's so far and so remote. And they get there and say, have you ever heard this man named Jesus? No, no, no. They get eight or ten villages in and they said, oh, Jesus, yes, we think we know that man. He owns some cows and went over there and sold them in the market. No, never even heard his name. But the Bible says there's no other name, other name under heaven which we could be saved than what? The name of Jesus. And that name is meant to be preached to the ends of the earth. And then the end will come. See, there are people that need to hear that name. There are people that have never even called upon that name, the name that you know, the name that we've sung about, the name that we've lifted so high. But there are now pockets of people that are following him in these remote parts of the world, and every day it is a fight. I want you to know if you're a follower of Jesus today, be prepared to be in for a fight to fight for that, that faith, to fight to follow him, to take the steps that you need to. As I said, so many of us, though, we can say Jesus is Lord with our mouths, but our lives aren't lining up with that reality. We can say we're followers of Jesus, but we're really just fence sitters. We're standing, we're wavering between this world and Jesus, and we've not even taken the first steps of obedience to really follow him. I want you to know today, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus... 
you may be at risk of just sitting on the fence. Have you taken any steps to really follow him? I would challenge you today that the first step you take after you make the decision to follow Jesus is to step into the waters of baptism. I want you to know you might be sitting on the fence today if you say you follow Jesus, but you haven't yet been baptized. Because it's not the last step you take before you die. It's the first step you take after you say yes to Jesus. Man, today would be a great day for you to make that decision. To say I'm getting off the fence and I'm stepping into the waters of baptism. But I think there are some things that are fighting against you. And instead of letting them fight against you, what if you started to fight against them so that you could follow Jesus? I'm going to give you three areas out of this passage of Scripture that you need to fight against if you really want to be serious about following Jesus. The first one is this. You have to fight your fame. You have to fight against your own fame. You see, Jesus was asking a question, what do people think about me? What do people say about me? Who do they say that I am? What do they think of me? And they said, well, they think you're this person, you're a famous prophet, you're John the Baptist. To say, for someone to say that you're Elijah, it's like one of the greatest compliments you could ever make about someone. They say you're this guy. Now, Jesus, he goes on to recalibrate some things for them. In verse 30, he warned them not to tell anyone. And instead of him taking the accolades and the fame, he says this. He begins to teach them in verse 31 that the Son of Man, Jesus, would suffer many things be rejected by the elders, be rejected by the chief priests, be rejected by the teachers of the law, and that he would be killed, he must be killed, and after three days he would raise from the dead. Jesus said to them, they say all those things, but I want to tell you the truth right now. I'm going to be rejected by all these people. I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, but on the third day I'm going to raise from the dead. Jesus was showing them it's not about the fame of this world. It's not about the accolades. It's not about what people can say about you. It's not about pleasing men. It's about being obedient to God's will for your life. And I want you to know something today. If you've decided to follow Jesus, you have to begin to fight against your own fame. It's not about you anymore. Live your life to make Jesus famous. Live your life so other people will see Jesus. Live to lift him up in every way in your life and watch what he will do. What it means is you have to be willing to humble yourself. What it means is you have to be willing to throw off some things that this world would measure as successful and be willing for some to become just like everyone else and anyone else, to become anonymous for the sake of making him famous. Are you with me today? I think of this woman that I met when I was in Tanzania. Her name's Dolphy. And Dolphy is a, an extraordinary woman because 20 years ago, she was praying and seeking the Lord. She's a follower of Jesus. She had a very comfortable life. She had served our country in the military and the armed uh, forces. And then she went on to a career in IT um, back in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s. But as she was following Jesus and she had fully surrendered her life to him, she wasn't sitting on the fence. Where you lead me, I will follow, Lord. No turning back. One night, Dolphy has a dream. And in her dream, she sees a group of people in Africa. She had been to Africa before, but she didn't recognize these people. And they were doing this dance and they were singing and they were speaking in a certain dialect. She, I mean, she had no idea. They were doing this kind of jumping up and down that was very distinct. She saw one man, he had a big line, a black line going down his face. She wondered, who are these people? And she felt the Spirit of God in this dream say, this is who I've called you to. So she wakes up and she talks to her pastor and they connect with missionaries in Africa. And she tries to describe with great detail these people. No one's ever heard of them. No, nothing matches that description. And so um, she's praying and she can't get this image from out of her mind. So she says, all right, Lord, I'm going to go. So she signs up to be a missionary associate. What that means is she would go to support missionaries in the field. So she went to Africa because she recognized that she, she believed that they were from Africa somewhere. And as she was there, she started to work in IT for the missionaries. And she just, anytime a missionary's computer was broken down on the field, she would go to them or they would come to her and she would fix it and get them up and running so they can continue to minister. Well, over a period of time, she kept getting a call from missionaries in Tanzania. And they said, we need you to come. We need you to come. We need you to come. It never lined up. She wanted to be a good steward of finances. And Tanzania was kind of a, quite a journey from the country that she was in. She said, maybe if I can get four or five pastors, it'll be worth my time. Well, they kept calling, kept reaching out. Finally, they got through to They said, we are driving up, we're picking you up, and we're driving you down. 
She said, okay, fine. I don't know what the emergency is. They picked her up. They drove her down and said, all right, what is it about the computer? What do you need IT help with? And they said, quite honestly, it's not, not too much on the computer end of it, but we've been praying, and we feel like you're supposed to be a part of helping us plant a church among a group of people that have never heard the name of Jesus, the Detog people. She said, okay. You know, and she, she prayed on it. She said, well, let, let, me, let me go with you into the village. She goes into the village and sees with her own eyes the people from her dream years ago. Dancing, jumping, and she's overwhelmed. She says, yes. Follow this. She says, yes. She becomes a missionary. She starts helping them plant the church. She said, Lord, these people, there's no written language. They're so remote. There are nomadic people that have now settled in this deep wilderness in the bush. I mean, literally, it takes hours and hours to drive there. Um, and so she's like, Lord, I, I don't know how to speak their language. I don't know anything. If you've really called me, you're going to have to help me. Within nine months, she was able to learn the Datog language. Nine months. No books, no education, no nothing. None of the other people that helped plant the church with her did. Within two years, every single one of them left, leaving her all alone there in the bush among the Datog people. No one's coming to Jesus at this point. They're completely resistant to the gospel. They've never heard the name of Jesus. Over time... She gave up a life of being a successful, everything else, to go and live anonymously among a group of people who, when she first moved there, they couldn't even communicate with her. But that's what happens sometimes when you follow Jesus, when you're obedient to his plan. It's not about your fame. It's not about your success. It's not about notoriety. It's about being obedient to the call. For her to fight to follow Jesus, it meant that. You know why? Because God had such extraordinary plans for her she could have never imagined. Through her faithfulness, it opened doors for the gospel to be preached to a group of people that had never heard the name of Jesus. And at one moment, during a Jesus film that they played, and after years of pressing in, they received the first people of that village that called upon the name of the Lord Jesus to save them from their sins. Among them was a man named Gil. Gil was the town drunk. He was so bound in alcoholism. They had been to all the witch doctors. They had done everything they could. They could not find freedom or relief for Gil. And so he was living his life just completely bound. But the moment he met Jesus, his addiction was broken. He was set free completely. In fact, when he responded to Jesus, he became sober, he said. In that moment, and he began to follow Jesus, he did not even have a kindergarten education. And so over time, as he's being discipled, he's weeping because he has this Bible in Swahili. That's, they can kind of, uh, Swahili, it has a, a little bit of what the Datog can speak and understand in it. Um, but that's the closest thing. He said, Lord, I have this. I can't read, and, and I want to know you. But how can I not know you if, if I can't read? How, Lord, would you punish me like this? How, how would you not let me, please? So he would sleep with his Bible under his pillow and pray every day, Lord, help me to know how to read this. After about a month of him praying, he woke up one morning and he just began to be able to read the word of God. No training, no nothing. I mean, miraculously. Some of you are like, I don't know if I buy that, Pastor. I, I met the guy. What can I tell you? Our God, if he can lift people out of wheelchairs and heal cancer, he teaches people how to read that don't even have an education. He began to fight to follow Jesus. He lived his life to make Jesus famous at whatever the cost. It's the first thing you have to learn how to do. The second thing you have to learn how to fight is you have to fight your feelings. Sometimes it's going to be very difficult in this life. Jesus, in fact, guaranteed it. In this life, you will have trouble. You will have problems, but take heart. I've overcome the world. I want you to know so many of us, we've claimed to follow Jesus. We've lost the fight to our own feelings. We become overwhelmed by our feelings, overwhelmed by our frustrations, overwhelmed by whatever it might be, and it's kept us on the fence, or it's even caused us to want to throw in the towel and stop following Jesus. How many people that were followers of Jesus have just given up even on their faith when the going got difficult? When the challenges came, you have to know that feelings are very real. Your emotions are there, but you can take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. Greater is he that is in you. And so these emotions become very real. In fact, we see a flare-up of emotion by who, who else but Peter, the apostle. That guy never gets emotional in the scriptures. But he has this, this reaction to Jesus when Jesus tells him that he's going to suffer and die. Just at the very mention that Jesus is going to suffer, 
Peter loses his mind. Verse 32, it says, Jesus spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Did you ever catch that before? Peter begins to rebuke Jesus. Like, how dare you say that you're going to die and suffer? Don't speak that way. He rebukes him. You know why? Because Peter couldn't get over his own feelings. Like, how could you say that? You're going to suffer. You're going to die. And at times, our feelings will get the better of us, won't they? But look what Jesus says to him. Jesus turned. He looked at his disciples. Interesting that that's there. And he rebuked Peter. And he said, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. How many times do our emotions, our feelings, fill us with all the concerns of man, all the concerns of this world, and at times you have to say, get behind me. I want to be concerned with what God wants right now in this moment. He said, your mind isn't on the concerns of, of God, but on the concerns of man. But at times, the, the emotions, the feelings can, can get the better of us. We can feel like it's too hard, like we got to just give up, but it can be a real challenge. Some of you may have faced that in some form or another. I feel like I saw the most extreme cases of it over the last 10 days. That brings us to Mafia Island. Mafia Island is an island off the coast of Tanzania. 100,000 people, and as of today, less than 200 Christians on this island. Out of, of 100,000 people, less than 200 Christians. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there were maybe no known Christians on the island. It's an Islamic stronghold with radical Islam believers there. And in day, they practice that, but it's also a haven for witchcraft. There's a stronghold of witchcraft uh, that's on that island. And so it's kind of a perfect storm like you could never imagine. Prostitution runs rampant. Um, child prostitution runs rampant on this island. Um, there will be things, if I, if I would go into detail about what the missionary shared with us, it would make you blush, church. Um, it's overwhelming to consider the persecution that's happening on this island. If you're a follower of Jesus, it means that you no longer are employable. If you decide to follow Jesus, you're excommunicated. For some, if you follow Jesus, you're beaten. There's one pastor on this island that has planted a church. He was um, of the Islam Muslim faith. When his wife and, and family found out, she divorced him and left him all alone to follow Jesus. Man, if we put things into context, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turn, no none go with me, not even my wife and children. Still, I will follow. You imagine the toll that that can take on someone. On this island, we were able to spend three days there, going amongst the people, got to meet a tremendous man named Pastor Joshua. Pastor Joshua, 25 years ago, was called to Mafia Island. He lived in a big city in the mainland. He had a very successful business. But Jesus called him to the ministry, and he left his church, his business, everything, and went to Mafia Island and lived in a guest house. And as he lived there, he instantly, within 24 hours, had to go back to God and say, Lord, have you left me here to die? I have nothing. I have no one. I don't know what I'm going to do. And he began from that point where the Lord met him and just began to slowly build over time. In 20 years of ministry... Less than 100 total converts. Less than 100 people called upon the name of the Lord. But I want to tell you, when you haven't met one Christian on the island and you have 100, praise God. Now there's an island where the light of the world is flowing in. Praise God. He met up with an organization called World Serve that helps bring the gospel through water projects and other things. And they partnered with him and they dug um, in Joyce Meyer Ministries, if you've heard of Joyce Meyer, came alongside as well. They dug 12 clean water wells around the island where they had no access to water. And in the last five years, they went from 100 believers to almost 200 believers. It took them 20 years to get to 100. And in less than five years, they've doubled that now. The church is growing on Mafia Island. But there's persecution. If you're a Christian believer and you go to give birth, they find the infant mortality rate on Mafia Island is astonishing. Almost every Christian child, many of them are dying because the doctors, as they're giving birth, and they know they're Christians, they actually will kill the baby as they're delivering the baby. If a woman needs a C-section, then they sterilize the woman and make it so that she can never have children again. 
so that they won't have any more Christians on the island. This is the kind of persecution that's happening on this island. There's such a stronghold of witchcraft. In fact, there were four pastors of the six that he had placed in different places as the gospel was spreading. Church, I'm talking about churches of 12 people, 10 people that are calling upon the name of the Lord in the middle of the wilderness. There's one village in, in particular. It's in the heart of witchcraft there. It's, uh, th- this village in particular is one that's, um, that the people are very burdened. They're very broken. Um, it's Chungarumba is the way that you pronounce it. And here, they are now on their third pastor in the last few years. The other two pastors gave up. They had to go back to the mainland. They couldn't do it. it. Their feelings got the better of them. They were overwhelmed. And now they have an amazing pastor. He's seen great success. Uh, Pastor Dowdy, Pastor Dowdy and his beautiful wife, Christina, this is Mandy and I with them. When we got there to to this village in particular, I could just sense in my spirit, this was a pastor and his family. They were about to throw in the towel. I could sense they were so burdened. The missionary began to tell us that they were burdened. They said their children are under spiritual attack. So what do you mean? They are a family of five. They have three children Two of them, when he would begin preaching on Sunday mornings, it would just fall on the ground and begin to have epileptic seizures. There are witch, witch doctors that are there that are trying to curse what's going on in that church. After they ran the last two pastors out of town, they would bulldoze and set the church on fire to destroy it. This is like the third time this church has been rebuilt. But now they're gaining momentum and God's moving but it's taking a toll on them. They were just so burdened. From the time I stepped out of the van and I walked in, I could feel the Lord prompting us to do something. And I said to Mandy, Mandy, go through your bag. We got to talk to the missionary. We're supposed to do something. Like, I don't know what we're supposed to give them or do for them. And we began to just get to know them a little more and said, where's your house, pastor? They pointed to the church in a little room in the back of the church. There was just a tiny little room. And they said, that's where they're living right now, a family of five. I mean, a, a room like this big. And they said, that's the pastor's house that he's been building for a long time, but he just doesn't have any money. They make a whopping $5 a week, a dollar a day for their work. They showed us this house. Mandy and I began to pray. We felt the Spirit of the Lord was speaking. So we shared with that pastor, Pastor, we're going to take on this house, and it's going to be finished in a few weeks. We're able to provide the funds needed, and we were able to finish this house. It's going to be done. And I can't wait to show you the picture and show you what it will look like for this family of five. We're believing God's going to bring breakthrough to that village. Amen. And now we're sowing a seed there. And we're going to see that begin to bring about a harvest of just encouragement and love to that pastor. So pray for Pastor Dowdy and Christina in the village of Chumarunga. That's a, a place where there's so much persecution, so much spiritual warfare that's going on there. But as they continue to fight to follow Jesus, he's going to give them victory. Because there's people that are holding up their arms now right here in America. Amen? And we know that as we pray, God's moving in that place and among those people. The final thing we have to do is we have to fight against our own flesh. You have to fight your flesh if you want to fight to follow Jesus. Come on up, Pastor Rick. What that means is we have to begin to learn what it means to deny ourselves. Jesus says in Mark 8, 34, when he called the crowd to him... Among his disciples, he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must, must, not should, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. When you're taking up your cross, you're signing your death certificate. When you're denying yourself, you're denying your flesh, you're denying the temptations of this life, you're denying anything else that would keep you, and you're saying, Jesus, where you go, I will follow you. The old missionaries of old, back in the early parts of the 1900s, when they were going to go and be a missionary, they had to do it by boat. They weren't flying a 10 or 12 hour flight. They weren't flying a 20 hour flight or whatever. They literally packed everything they owned into a coffin, stuck it on a boat, and they were going, meaning, I'm I'm going there and I'm never coming home. Where you lead me, I will follow. Talk about taking up your cross and following Jesus. These people, like Dolphy, she went, she thought, they said it'll be a two-year assignment. She said, no, I'm going to be there for 20 years or until Jesus takes me home, whatever it is, but I'm giving my whole life to see the Datog people come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. You have to be willing to deny your flesh, deny the temptations that you would have in yourself and say, Lord, where you lead me, I'm going to follow you. Thank God for people that hear the call of God and follow them. 
Where is God calling you? How is God calling you to live your life? Will you hear him and will you follow him? Will you get off the fence and fight against your own flesh that might hold you back? For Gil, I told you about Gil. Gil's standing there and he has the red, uh, the red sash over him. And as he's standing there, he's talking to all these children. He has grown to love the Lord. And as he was early in his faith and he was so excited, the village that he was from called him. And they said, Gil, come. We have to talk to you about something seriously. Are you following this Jesus? He said, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus now. And they didn't like that. His family. See, the husbands have multiple wives, so he has 49 brothers and sisters. He has, he has, he has such an enormous family. Them and the rest of the village, they called him, and they'd have this very serious meeting with Gil. And they, they held out two hands. They said, this hand, Gil, is milk and honey. That sounds familiar, huh? They said, this is life and prosperity and acceptance in your family and community. This hand is blood. It's the end of your life and death. Which will you choose, Gil? He looked at them and he said, I choose the blood because there's a man named Jesus who bled and died for me already and my life isn't my own. It belongs to him now. I said, why would you say you choose the blood? No one, no, this was like the ultimatum a village would make. This wasn't new to him. They would always choose milk and honey. You always choose the good. Said, no, I choose blood because it's Jesus' blood that saved me. And they said, okay, if you choose the blood, this is what it means. If you get hurt, they told the whole village. They made everyone swear on it. If Gil gets hurt, no one helps him. If he gets attacked by a wild animal and he's crying out for help, no one comes to his aid. If he needs to go to the hospital, no one carries him there. No one assists him at all. He's left to die on his own. He chooses the blood. This is what happened to this man. This is what it cost him to follow Jesus. He was excommunicated from his village and from his family. And then one day, there had been a, a series of attacks on the village. And two people were killed by a lion. And as this lion would come and he'd prowl around at night, I mean, it sounds, like, it sounds like scripture. The enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for he might devour. They, there were two attacks that killed two people. So people were on watch and they were on guard. And Gil is walking throughout the village by himself. And there the lion is. And he takes his spear and he throws it at the lion. And with this accuracy he could not have had on his own, he hits the jugular vein of the lion and kills it. And now the village comes, they hear the commotion, they look at Gil standing over the dead lion that's been kind of ramsacking and rampaging in their village. And they said, okay, Gil, now the whole village every night is going to come to your house, to your front door, and they're going to sing to you. Because this is what happens if you protect the village in that way. Now they're in service and in debt to you. So the man who was excommunicated from the village lays down his life to try to protect the people that have kicked him out. And they said, now all the village has to come to your house in groups every night. And every night he could tell them about the love of Jesus. Every night he could tell them about the love of Jesus. And now in that village, there is a church of 80 people that are, last Sunday while you were here, I was with them worshiping the Lord. They were lifting their voice so loud. This is the church after it let out. There are children standing there in the middle. Here's what amazed me, that before a few years ago, no one in that village had ever heard the name of Jesus. And now there are children that will never know anything but the name of Jesus in their lives. They'll never know anything but the name of Jesus. Their whole lives are changed. Their whole futures are changed. There's a clean water well there. There's a school that's been built there. There's ministry that's happening. There's just a flourishing in that community because people took seriously the call to follow Jesus. Did you notice Gil's face and the line on his face? Well, Dolphy started to develop feelings for Gil. And Gil was in love with Dolphy. <laughs> And they ended up getting married a few years ago. And now Gil is a minister and missionary with Dolphy. And they're just going from village to village among the Detog people, winning them to Jesus. Amen? In fact, in a few months, they're going to move from that village I just showed you to another village we got to be in a few days ago where they've never heard the name of Jesus. And they're just going to uproot their lives and move there until they begin to know Jesus and they can plant a church there. 
and lead people to Christ. This is what it means to follow Jesus. One foot in front of the other. Fight every day. Fight against your own fame. Fight against your own feelings. Fight against the flesh that might hold you back. Put one foot in front of the other. And where Jesus leads you, go. Get off the fence. Stop wavering between two opinions. Because when you step into this life with Jesus, when you step into his story, the power of God meets you in ways you could never imagine. It says in Zechariah 4, 6, it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit, says the Lord. His spirit takes control and begins to move in and through people. Jesus says this, whoever wants to save their life is going to lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel is going to save it. What good is it for you to gain the whole world and forfeit your own soul? If you're going to follow Jesus, be willing to fight to follow him. Don't sit on the fence. Don't be passive. Choose the blood every time. Not the comforts of this life, not anything else, not security in anything, but just choose to follow Jesus. When you do that, no matter the cost, God's going to bless you and lead you and guide you. On Mafia Island, I told you about, right there on Mafia Island, this past Sunday, six people were water baptized on that island in one church alone. Six people were water baptized, and as they were water baptized, their whole lives are different now. That church grew by 3%. There are 3% more Christians on that island in one day in one service. You better believe they know what they're talking about. They're an empowered people. They're just stepping out to do whatever God calls them to. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I want you to know that when you're serious about following Jesus, when you begin to fight to follow him, the power of God begins to fight for you. The power of God begins to move through your life. The power of the Holy Spirit begins to show up in your life and you begin to realize that you can and do things you never thought you could do before because you're walking with God, because you're following Jesus. This leads us to our next series that we're going to walk into. We learn to fight the good fight. We learn to be rooted and grounded in God's love and in the the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And this next series is going to be called Gifted. We're going to kick off next week. We're going to learn to walk in the power and gifts of the Holy Spirit and how they can be manifest among us. I want you to know that God's gifted you and the Holy Spirit has gifted you. And for so many of you, you don't even understand what that means yet. We're going to take a series and we're going to understand how each one of us has been unique gifted by God and we're meant to use those gifts so that we could serve others and see the power of the Holy Spirit move through our lives. Amen. So that's what we're going to walk into over the next weeks and we want you to not miss out on that. But for today, where do you stand? Are you on the fence or are you all in? Have you decided to follow Jesus? The six people last Sunday on Mafia Island, their lives will never be the same. And today, today in a room this size, I want you to know, Mafia Island, if we just take this group right here, this section, you make up roughly the amount of total Christians on an island of 100,000 people. Don't worry about everyone else. I'm talking about just you right here. Six people said, yes, I'm following Jesus. Look at all of us here today. How many of us are still sitting on the fence? How many of us still haven't even taken that first step into the waters? Don't stand by anymore. Don't live in your comfort zone. Step out and say, Jesus, I'm all in. I'm not holding back anymore. I want to follow you with everything that I have. May the Spirit of God today speak to you, stir something in you, so you'll take that step of obedience. We're going to be standing to our feet right now. If everyone around the room could just stand to your feet. And today, if you're ready to get baptized, if you're ready to follow Jesus, and you come prepared for that, step out of your seats in church. Let's celebrate with those that are going to be joining the good fight of faith as they're heading out. But listen to me. If you're here today and you're ready to get baptized and you've not yet been baptized, don't wait any further. We have shirts. We have water. If you're a follower of Jesus, nothing should hold you back in this moment. Don't sit on the fence anymore. Get serious about your walk with God. Don't waver between two places. Be all in for Jesus and watch what he'll do through your life. So at any point in time, if that's you, step out of your seat right now. Go out into the foyer. Our pastors will be there to greet you. We'll give you a shirt and give you the change of clothes you need. But come on, church, let's see and celebrate with those that are willing to follow Jesus in this way.
We're going to ask everyone to hang tight, sing the worship songs. Don't anyone leave so we can all celebrate with those being baptized.